Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Analyzing Patient Feedback to Navigate a Public Health Crisis. I am Brian Zimmerman with Becker's Hospital Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. And at this time, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Sid Banerjee is Founder and Chief Strategy Officer at ClaraBridge. Sid provides executive leadership and strategic direction and is a well-known expert in customer experience, business intelligence, and text mining. Over his career, Sid has amassed more than 20 years of business intelligence leadership experience. A founding employee of MicroStrategy, he held VP-level positions in both product marketing and worldwide services. During his tenure leading MicroStrategy's worldwide services division, he grew the organization to 500-plus employees, supporting enterprise deployments of BI solutions. Before joining MicroStrategy, Sid held management positions at Ernst & Young and Sprint International. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Sid to begin today's presentation. Take it away, Sid. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for your interest in uh, attending this webinar. We're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so talking a bit about how organizations can best analyze and use the, uh, the voice of the patient to help better optimize uh, the entire uh, provider experience uh, through hospital care and uh, also understanding how to also be responsive during periods of dramatic change, such as the changes that we've seen over the last couple of months with the COVID pandemic taking over the country and really the world. Uh, the agenda that we have for today really covers four, uh, four key topics. One, uh, an overview of the patient experience and how to tap into that patient experience to better understand opportunities for improving patient health care, patient outcomes, and financial um, and organizational effectiveness in those, in those use cases. And then specifically getting into some of the improvement areas that we've seen uh, providers uh, implementing as they listen to the voice of the patient and use patient analytics to improve healthcare and health outcomes. We'll also spend some time talking about some of the interesting and special considerations that have really arisen over the last few months with COVID-19. And then we'll finally just adjourn with a quick overview of ClaraBridge, the company that I helped found and grow over the last few years, uh, and provide a little bit of context for the technology that really drives a lot of this analytics capability uh, in healthcare. So let's start with the really the, the patient experience or uh, more broadly speaking, the consumer experience. One of the things that we've noticed over the last really five, six years, actually going back almost 10 years now, is that um, historically patient care was not thought of in the same way that customer experience is thought of in other industries like banking, retail, et cetera. But there have been a few interesting changes here in the United States specifically that have really changed the, the healthcare landscape. The first is that um, health plans have become much more democratized across not just employee but also retail and, and Affordable Care Act options and have created much more of a competitive marketplace for health care. And that's also improved the, the visibility and frankly the intelligence I think of many of the patients as they look for products and services. The other sort of mirror uh, impact of that is that healthcare organizations have seen changing incentives in the way that they offer healthcare, moving away for just from a fee per service and more to outcome-based um, reimbursements for, for services, which are changing the way that organizations think about measuring and ultimately achieving healthcare outcomes that drive the right outcomes for patients and the right uh, financial outcomes for organizations. But in order to really understand how to improve those outcomes, you need to do more than just focus on uh, the medical aspects of healthcare. You need to really understand the experiences of those patients as they speak to uh, engage with an organization, as they provide feedback, as they encounter problems with communications, with scheduling, with their experience in the actual healthcare environment, and ultimately understand how those things affect everything from the reviews and ratings that exist in Medicare systems like HCAPs, as well as the choices that patients make as they start to share and learn about the provider experience by, uh, by seeing the information that's much more publicly available than it ever has been. So it's really important to listen to that voice of the patient everywhere it is, understand by extracting the insights, the drivers, um, and the potential causes that need to be fixed to improve outcomes to begin with, and then use a continuous improvement process to measure, fix, measure again, 
fix again. And so you have a virtuous cycle of continuous improvement. How does that work? Um, I think if you think about the, um, the main sort of drivers in healthcare, one, we mentioned the fee-for-service uh, migration to more value-based payments means it's important to understand the metrics that are driving um, those kinds of value outcomes and what interactions, what experiences, what customer experiences that patients talk about tend to align both to the positive and negative um, value that's received by those providers. It's also important to understand how people uh, perceive organizations because information is much more available, much more freely available online, on the Internet, and in uh, government and, and public sources of information that give uh, patients increasing information as they make choices uh, where they decide to, to take their healthcare decisions. And then finally, it's important to link the expressed feelings and emotions and, frankly, outcomes, how people feel during and after care to the treatments that are being provided so that you can have a clearer sense of which outcomes drive the, um, the positive and which outcomes drive the negative so that you can maximize not just patient health outcomes but financial outcomes as you start to get value-based uh, pay and you get value-based reimbursements from government agencies and from insurance companies. The challenges, however, when you think about, I mean, it's nice to say we, we want to do all this. The challenges are that the data and the analytics and, frankly, the insights are not as easily available to most organizations in the, in the present environment that, that most providers find themselves in. Um, information that comes from government sources like the, uh, uh, the CAP surveys, which are used by uh, CMS to determine reimbursement rates, are very high level. They tend to be based on a, on a very kind of dry set of questions that survey uh, patients after their experiences, and they don't provide the kind of granular level insights that give you the ability to really understand what experiences um, drove what scores because they tend to be very, very structured and, frankly, not very verbose. And actually, the response rates to CAP surveys are also quite low. So you run into an issue of sparse data. Um, the other thing is that patient engagement, which is really how patients interact with your organization when they call you, when they interact with nurses and doctors, when they um, have conversations through digital as well as through audio sources. None of that is really contained in the traditional survey research methodologies. But that information exists in most organizations uh, of any scale. That information is in phone calls, it's in digital records, it's in nurses' notes, it's in doctor uh, feedback. And that information can be quite useful to really understand where you're driving positive and negative interactions and outcomes. The other challenge is that most of the information that really provides the actionable intelligence is not structured. It's, it's conversational, and it's verbal, and it's written, and it's on recordings. And so um, to really make sense of the, the patient experience, you need to be able to extract the features and the drivers and the outcomes that live in sentences and paragraphs, not in rows and columns of a database. 90% of the information in most organizations today is unstructured. And if you're like most health organizations or healthcare uh, providers, you probably are only tapping into a very, very small percentage of that unstructured data from an analytics perspective. You're capturing it, you're reading it, but you're not really analyzing it at scale. And so it's important to be able to have a technology layer that can make sense of that information and use it to drive analytical uh, insights and analytical outcome improvements. The third challenge is that information does not exist in one place in most organizations. Uh, many organizations have built up their, their data infrastructure, their IT architecture over time in, in silos. The different groups, whether you're in the contact center, whether you're in a customer-facing role or patient-facing role, whether you're in management, uh, or even whether you're you know, owning the digital infrastructure both for your business or for your organization or you're trying to tap into information in public sources like social media, that information is dispersed across many different um, technologies, many different systems of record, and frankly, very little of it has been brought together to truly understand the full journey of your patients as they're, as they're interacting with you, as they're thinking about doing business with you, and as they come and go during the patient treatment process. So it's important to be able to pull that data together, but without uh, an architecture and a solution that does it in a holistic way, it's very easy to end up with a much more complicated analysis problem than you had before, where information is just ad hoc linked together, and you cannot compare the information from one source against another because there's not a common ontology or naming convention or analytical approach to make sense of information from different sources. So what we need to do is you really need to build a solution 
that pulls all of that information together and uh, pulls it into a holistic framework for understanding and then an analytical application layer that can provide the insights to the various parts of an organization that can be used to improve business decisions, whether they're again in marketing or treatment or payment or executive policy making. And that's really what we have at Clarebridge have been building over the years and offering to companies to help them have that consolidated view to improve that customer or in, in the healthcare context patient experience. So how does it all work? At a very high level, you can think of the analysis sort of problem being solved through three layers of abstraction. At the highest layer, and really described on the top of this slide, we listen and, and we help you listen. And listening means connecting to all of the different interaction sources and types that exist in an organization. And in most organizations, you can, you can define them in four broad categories. Interaction information, which is the interaction when a patient calls you, emails you, interacts with an agent or an employee of the company, and there's some conversational uh, record of that, of that interaction. Online feedback is anything that is posted to a website or a public social or review or online uh, forum that can be used to help you understand the experience of that patient as they've written about it during or after the experience. Survey feedback, uh, pretty self-evident. That's anything from your Press Ganey surveys to information that might be run through survey programs like the HCAP surveys or any internal um, systems you might run on an ad hoc basis to, to ping your customers and your patients about their experiences. And then finally, any operational data that exists to um, kind of stitch together the context of, of the patient experience, information about their age, their demographics, their social determinants, as well as any information that comes in from financial systems or other systems of record that gives a little bit more context to this person's um, experience with you and, and their drivers of different types of outcomes or, or interactions. The analytics layer is really where a lot of the magic happens, and that's where you take all the unstructured data, the calls, the text, the conversations, and you extract the markers of that patient experience that you need to analyze to improve your business. Um, for, you know, for analysis purposes, you can think of the extraction process being uh, quantifying qualitative things like emotion, sentiment, effort, um, you know, things that people use to express their experiences but are very kind of fuzzy if they're not turned into quantitative terms or measures, as well as the kinds of experiences and topics and categories that typically exist in healthcare. And again, healthcare is, uh, is an industry that knows a lot about categorization. You, you use codes to diagnose, you use codes to treat. Um, that information is also buried in a lot of the interaction text that's in the notes and in the conversations. We want to pull that out as well. And then finally, we want to apply um, uh, predictions and, and calculations on that data. So running the actual extracted language into categories and then applying math and statistics and predictions gives you an ability to try to connect the dots and see what types of in inputs and interactions lead to what kinds of actions. That's all done in this analysis layer in the middle. Finally, once you've done that, you want to expose the information to people that may or may not be statisticians or, or you know, really technical people. They're the folks that are on the front lines or the folks that are in management. So it's important to have a reporting and the notification or alerting layer that can push that information out to the right people in the right form. And that's really what happens at the ACT layer in the bottom. Together, this really is the architecture for understanding the, case, the patient experience and making sure that it gets to the right uh, people in an organization so that they can understand how to fix things and then they can provide that, uh, drive that continuous improvement in their organization. So in specifically the healthcare context, what are the kinds of uh, outcomes and the kinds of um, personas, if you will, that are typically looking to act on the patient experience? So starting from the bottom now and working way up, the types of folks that typically benefit from understanding the, the, the voice of the patient are your customer or patient experience teams that are looking to make continuous improvements to various parts of the patient journey, resolution teams that are looking to minimize uh, the complaints and, and conflicts that exist in the healthcare treatment cycle, the contact center, which is looking to drive efficiency, to lower effort, to lower hold time, to lower costs associated with everything from scheduling to billing to resolution of different issues, claims. And then when you get into the facility group and the digital groups, you've got folks that are really owning parts of the patient experience from either a, a people or a process or a technology perspective. And any feedback that can come to them to help them fix things or optimize things along the way is also helpful. 
Um, that information is informed by bringing together all the kinds of information you see on the top of this chart, right? the different types of surveys, the different types of complaints and calls, as well as information that can come from hospital data that is currently being collected but probably not being analyzed in this type of a patient experience context, as well as data that comes in from social and digital techn technologies that are either in the organization or in the social media sphere but that are useful to the organization. And basically the way that it all works is you collect the data, you sort of serialize it and diarize it, which is to say you understand if there's more than one person in a conversation who's saying what. You run that data through a set of natural, what's called natural language processing or natural language understanding algorithms, which allow you to take, again, long form sentences and documents and turn them into scores and categories and ontology based models that you can then use to analyze and operationalize your business. And that is really the, the sort of the technology sort of approach that takes all this information and turns it into the insights that can then be used across the organization. In the healthcare context, we think about models that sort of make sense of unstructured data, that essentially categorize it, if you will, in a number of different domains. Patient satisfaction is the information that really describes where in the experience of the patient journey a customer is having positive or negative experiences, where they're having easy or hard experiences. And this can give you a view to where you may need to optimize parts of that journey, to either reduce time, reduce effort, or ultimately reduce complaints. Um, patient engagement gives you a sense of the specific actions that your uh, healthcare workers, the doctors and nurses are taking that are leading to positive and negative experiences and positive and negative outcomes. And then there's the ability to drill into this data using a technique that combines uh, machine learning and AI techniques to look for the root causes or the drivers of good or bad engagement or good or bad uh, drivers of satisfaction. Those deep dives give you the actionability and the insights to improve uh, and, and ultimately um, fix problems, improve the experiences and, and fix uh, problems that might exist in your business. Another, uh, another way to think about the business is when you get away from the models, which are focused on, uh, oops, sorry, there we go, uh, that, that get into the quantitative. The qualitative is also equally interesting. And one of the things we learned over the years um, with our business at Clarebridge is that there are early indicators in the way that people talk about things that can point you to problem or areas in your business. Um, one of the interesting early indicators is a concept called effort. Effort is when you're talking to somebody and you say, hey, it was really, really hard to do this particular thing, or I waited for 20 minutes on hold before someone answered my phone call, or um, the website is just terrible to navigate and I don't know how to figure out whether my claim was, was being processed or not. Those are all language markers that describe difficulty, time, complexity that really translate to effort. And when people talk about effort in an experience, that's typically a marker of an area where you're going to have a bad outcome, an, an unhappy customer, or potentially some sort of cost or liability in your business. Now, past the effort, people, when they continue to have high effort interactions, they go to the second stage, if you will, of, uh, of customer experiences, which is getting angry and having negative emotions. And so it's important to tease out emotion from conversations and interactions as well. They give you a little bit less leading indicator, but still an important indicator to things that are not going well in your business. Sentiment tends to come when people take a more dispassionate view of their experiences and they describe things with negative language, right? This was difficult. I'm upset. Um, I, you know, positive languages would be the service quality was excellent. So if you see positive sentiment, that's usually a good thing. Negative sentiment gives you a much more kind of dispassionate view of where people are specifically having good or bad experiences. And then finally, surveys are useful, but they tend to be quite lagging indicators because surveys tend to get filled out at the end of an experience. They tend to be filled out with very, very structured questions, so they don't tend to have the, the deep understanding of what's going on. And they also tend to not be as actionable because they don't give you um, the full way, journey of the whole experience. They tend to be just markers at tail ends of, of, of interaction. So you don't have the full context that you often need that you would get in, in the, um, the conversations and language that come from a more holistic approach. So it's important to, when you look at the customer experience, to look at these kinds of markers. And what we do, um, sorry, I'm just, is we use um, a, a basically a quantification of sentiment and effort 
and we give it a scale, a score from minus 5 to positive 5. Positive 5 is something is easy or something is positive, so easy effort or positive sentiment. Negative 5 is the opposite. It's a very negative sentiment or very hard from an effort perspective. And when you start to analyze language and you associate the topics using the models with the effort and the, and the um, sentiment using scores, you can very quickly across hundreds of thousands or even millions of interactions quickly pinpoint the parts of your experience with your patients that are good, neutral, and bad, and then figure out ways to improve the negative experiences. Um, it's also interesting and important to know that this approach isn't just a good idea, but it actually does correlate to the kinds of things that organizations are looking to do to improve customer and patient experiences. And there's been a fair amount of research on this from third parties. We've actually done some of this research ourselves with our own customers and their data. And we see a very, very clear correlation between the kinds of um, sentiment and effort scores that come from the language of your patients and the feedback of, of their experiences and the kinds of um, scores that you get when you run a syndicated survey, like a Press-Ganey survey or an HCAP survey after the fact. And it's important to know that those things correlate because if you want to find actionable things to fix, you want to know that if you fix those things, they don't just improve customer experience, but they also will have an, a positive impact on your Press Ganey surveys or your HCAP surveys, which will have an impact on your ability to, to, to get a higher level of reimbursement from Medicare. So there's, there's a strong ROI here in being able to fix the patient experience and know that it's also going to correlate to improving scores that have an impact on your financial performance. So when I think about this, or when you think about this from a persona perspective, diving into not so much the technology, but into the who uses a solution like this, there's really three core groups of, of folks that we tend to see diving into this data. The first being the folks that are looking to create the systematic programs and improvement areas in, on, in, a, in a hospital or, or a provider experience because they're focused on driving up loyalty, driving up scores, and ultimately being able to see that those improvements are driving things like reimbursement rates and, and um, star ratings and CAPS uh, survey scores. That's the customer experience or patient experience groups in most, most hospitals. Hospital leadership, obviously, like any executive function, are looking to know that they are driving performance improvements, continuous improvement, and financially um, driving financial health of their organization. So they tend to have a very high-level key performance indicator view of the patient experience that pulls together all the information that's being used at lower levels of the organization. <coughs> and then the third group are the operations and digital teams that really are keeping the wheels turning in the organization and are looking to make sure that if there's a problem with a website or a problem with a part of the hospital or a problem with the scheduling or any uh, digital infrastructure, that those problems are being found and fixed quickly so that the experience of patients is continuing to be as smooth as possible. So that's a very tactical user group, but one that's also very important. If I think about um, the sort of the, the actual value and how you measure value in patient experience, you can think of this from sort of two perspectives as well. One is in the interaction heavy parts of, of, a, of an environment of a business, the, the contact center areas tend to be um, the areas where you can find very quickly efficiencies, which will help shorten the time of a call, shorten the time uh, to a resolution, and ultimately not just save money in those contact center functions, but also improve customer satisfaction, customer loyalty, and customer ratings that have an impact on the kinds of syndicated scores that many organizations are looking to improve. So there's a lot of efficiency here, and that can be driven by fixing processes, by coaching the agents that are interacting, as well as just identifying and fixing complaints and reducing um, any kind of compliance or quality issues that exist in that, in that business. The other part of the organization that tends to benefit from patient experience is really folks that are looking at the interactions between patients and, and the organization across the patient journey. And this can be, again, admitting, servicing, or you know, uh, treating, uh, handling the financial aspects of the experience, as well as any complaints or issues that occur during and after that patient experience. And, and we also find that you don't want to just listen to the patients in a, in, a, in a healthcare setting. You also want to listen to doctors, to nurses. So these platforms can also be used to tease out information from employees and from service providers that work in a healthcare setting to help improve the experiences that they have working in the setting as well. And this drives, again, that continuous improvement of the actual 
working and, and functioning part of the organization. So um, when we think about hard ROI, you know, why would someone spend the time and money to invest in a patient experience or a provider experience solution? Um, what it really comes down to is in the healthcare um, contact center setting, which is on the right here, uh, saving efficiencies or creating efficiencies saves money. It tends to improve the customer experience scores, which tend to improve loyalty. And it also improves compliance and reduces risk for organizations, which ultimately good experiences tend to produce uh, members and, 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 and patients that have a preference to come back if they need to for their healthcare uh, services. On the, on the more of the CX or member experience or patient experience expect, uh, sort of side of the, of the coin, which is on the left, you're also looking to improve your quantitative measures, your scores, which tend to improve the, um, the top line drivers of loyalty and reimbursement, which drives revenue and also ultimately improves uh, outcomes and reduces complaints. So there's experience uh, benefits and financial benefits really on both uh, the, the kind of the, the member and patient side of things as well as on the cost side, particularly in some of the servicing functions that tend to flow into contact centers. Now, I'm going to flip over for another, uh, just another sort of few minutes to the issue of COVID-19. And um, we like to think about analyzing the voice of members and patients in really two kind of domains. One is ordinary course of business, which is when most organizations kind of know the journeys, they know the processes, and they generally know how to create continuous listening and continuous improvement. But there's also you know, an opportunity or, or situation in many organizations when a crisis might hit. And what a crisis introduces is uncertainty, changing expectations, changing experiences, and a lot of need to very quickly get situational awareness of what's different, what's changing, so you can respond quickly and effectively to those changes. And um, it's an understatement, of course, to say that COVID-19 was a crisis and is a crisis that's forced a lot of organizations to very quickly take stock of what's, what's different and how do we respond to this crazy chaotic change that's affected everybody's lives and everyone's businesses all at the same time. In healthcare, we, we sort of tracked um, using, again, machine learning technologies to try to understand the key themes that were different, that were cropping up in various parts of the, of the health experience for patients and for providers to try to help organizations navigate through the most, um, most obvious, but well, as well as some of the sort of less obvious changes that were occurring in the first few months of, of the pandemic kind of taking over the country. And we saw five major sort of themes emerge that were helping a lot of organizations still kind of navigate and track um, even as things have started to become a little bit more predictable than they were a few months ago. The first is understanding how healthcare policies, a provider, service policies, insurance policies were uh, either meeting the needs or not meeting the needs of patients going through the healthcare experience. The second is understanding access to specific procedures and specific types of uh, interactions that patients need, and, and those really break into tests, prescriptions, and telehealth, particularly as, um, as folks felt less comfortable going into healthcare settings face-to-face -face, uh, over the first few months of the crisis. The third, and, um, the third topic is really understanding who is being affected most, both from a social determinant perspective as well as from a geographic um, perspective, so that uh, hospitals and healthcare facilities could properly uh, prepare for and plan for and staff for where they needed to be uh, to, to meet certain kinds of um, experiences from certain types of their uh, patient population. And then finally, uh, claims management and contact standard management um, put a big, a big burden on a lot of healthcare organizations for being able to support the, the surge in need, the surge in calls and call volumes, and then ultimately um, the surge in handling basically payment plans, uh, forbearance, deferment, other kinds of things that came up as uh, the economy also created a drag on people's ability to pay. And I won't go into all of this in too much because I do want to make time for Q&A, but what you can see here is on this page, um, the models that we uh, essentially used machine learning to generate specific to COVID look to a certain extent like the kinds of models that you would see in normal day-to-day -day healthcare, but there's also some you know, specific things where we're looking for all occurrences and co-occurrences of any word that ties to COVID, uh, coronavirus, as well as the specific kinds of questions that people tended to ask most. So we could see how those questions were cropping up and by whom and in what context. That information helped hospitals 
and providers really uh, be more proactive in making sure that the right information was available to both agents to communicate to patients as well as on digital and websites so that people could quickly find what they were looking for. Um, the spiking of calls related to COVID, uh, you know, was dramatic, and particularly in the late part of March into April, it went from, you know, under 1% in January or uh, in December to basically 8 and it peaked around 10% in the April time frame. Uh, for the most part, um, these, these volumes have started to fall back down in general around the country, though there are still hot spots where, as you would expect, these volumes continue to be high. And so I think it's important if you're in the healthcare space to know how things are affecting you so you can prepare for the, um, the need and the, and the surge and demand for these kinds of questions when they come in. There we go. Um, in, the, in that spiking period of March and April, the main questions that came up and certainly the emotions we tracked were confusion and uncertainty specifically around are my, you know, are my treatment options going to be covered? Um, and of course, insurance companies largely uh, responded to that need in the April, May timeframe, but February, March were periods of peak confusion around where can I get tested? Can I get tested? Will I get covered payment for these things? Telehealth inquiries continue to be a big uh, driver of the transformation of healthcare right now. In the early part of the pandemic, there were a lot of questions about getting access to telehealth. More recently, um, we're seeing a lot of questions around scheduling and fulfillment of telehealth inquiries. Um, economic and financial difficulty are obviously a part of the, the payment and uh, processing experience, and um, we're finding a lot of the bigger hospitals are having to you know, formulate policy on the fly around handling payment um, options, deferment options, and just making sure that they have the right um, policy in place and financial plans in place to handle this through at least the end of the year. And then from a contact center perspective, we are finding that many of the um, healthcare providers moved from traditional in contact center building you know, telephone support models to one where a lot of their contact center operations, if not all of them, are now work from home. So there was a transition of moving the agents to a home office perspective, which incurred a fair amount of IT and, uh, and kind of uh, technology transformation tasks. And now, more recently, being able to really manage agents, provide coaching, uh, identify underperforming and overperforming agents, and make sure that there's a consistent level of quality becomes harder when a lot of these agents are working from home. So using the contact center analytics capabilities of these, of these solutions like ClaraBridges to really help to make sure that agents are performing to peak levels and, um, and are being coached to improve their performance where needed. That becomes a part of this process too, you know. And that that issue of, of you know coaching and, and agent quality and performance management has always been an issue, but it became an acute issue when everybody was forced into a work from home model. And I think what we found is that many organizations are not going to move back to a fully staffed in office model anytime soon. So what we saw COVID sort of encouraging in a very swift way of transitioning was likely going to be a slower transition if the pandemic hadn't occurred, but it is very much uh, looking like that's going to be the future staffing model for a lot of contact centers, even as the COVID pandemic subsides. Um, from an ongoing perspective, again, it's important to track things over time, to track things over what's spiking period over period. And so these are just examples of the kinds of analytics that you typically would set up in a particular part of an organization to track what's happening what's happening with positive or negative sentiment, what's happening uh, as a percentage growth over a period, prior period. And they provide an easy way to kind of navigate into what, uh, where do I need to think about solving a problem in my organization. Um, this is an example of the kinds of prescription and pharmacy concerns that we saw from a lot of folks trying to understand uh, access to healthcare options from a pharmacy perspective, as well as getting um, not just from a COVID perspective, but any healthcare treatment options um, as there were surges in, in demand for supporting you know, COVID uh, patients. Other patients had a harder time getting access to healthcare around prescriptions and pharmacy. And then this is just a, an example of the kinds of things we saw with healthcare uh, institutions as they moved from an in the office to a work from home contact center environment. Um, this is from a particular company that uh, had some issues with the technology transition into a work from home environment. And they were able to identify a big spike in people having difficulty hearing agents um, or being able to kind of get through to customer service because of hold times. 
they use that to then tune the environment and reconfigure the, um, the staffing models and ultimately this issue subsided a couple weeks later. But it's important to be able to identify and isolate problems as they occur, particularly during periods of change. As we look at really the last few months, March through June and, and even into the summer months now, we are seeing a lot of organizations are um, uh, kind of redirecting and, and, and solving these questions around pharmacy access. Um, we've seen a huge spike in telehealth services being offered by most, most providers around the country. And uh, it looks like the telehealth services are likely going to stay at a staffed up, uh, ramped, in, ramped up level for the foreseeable future, even as um, COVID caseloads decline, um, more patients are more comfortable with telehealth for diagnosis, both for physical and mental health uh, assessment needs. And we're also starting to see um, COVID copay issues have largely subsided as, as insurance companies and hospitals have kind of become more clear on what's being covered and how it's being covered. And finally, we're starting to see a better um, investment in digital infrastructure to help uh, patients uh, self-service their way through scheduling, through questions, and through post-service inquiries around, um, on, particularly on the, on the payer side, insurance payments and other things. Because as you saw this spike of, of questions coming into providers, you saw an equally large spike coming into the insurance companies that are you know, supporting payment and reimbursement. So they've had to respond very aggressively as well. And that's uh, been a heavy investments in digital transformation to help improve the digital journeys of those, of those providers and, frankly, of the payers and, um, and, the, and the patients. Um, I think in the, in the last couple of months, we are starting to see, again, a bit of a reconfiguration back to a new normal. Um, but what we are going to expect, I think, into the fall and into the end of the year is continued questions about treatment because treatment options, uh, questions about vaccinations are starting to spike up a bit more. Um, is there going to be a vaccination? How does one find one or get one? Um, the regional outbreaks and the, and the kind of hot spots that have been occurring create a desire for very strong situational awareness, particularly for uh, providers that have dispersed geographic coverage areas and they want to make sure that they can allocate resources appropriately to support those kinds of questions. And then finally, um, social determinants, contact center themes, and insurance questions are now currently tracked across many of these uh, healthcare organizations to just make sure that they are responsive to the sort of new normal operating business models, but also they look for any kind of spikes or changes in themes that are occurring as a result of any changes in the way that the pandemic is affecting their, their patients in their geographies. So it's, you know, it's, it's continuing to be a big part of the healthcare patient experience and the healthcare analysis uh, need in a lot of these organizations that we work with. But um, suffice to say that the infrastructure for understanding patient experience will persist beyond COVID because it does help to improve overall efficiencies and operations in an organization when you have a, a situational awareness and you can make sense of conversations and, and feedback and, uh, and surveys and calls and all the things that are part of those interactions that occur today in most organizations. So I will take the last couple of minutes and just talk briefly about who we are. Um, you know, we are, ClaraBridge is a software company that's developed the technology to really collect and understand the voice of the consumer and the voice of the patient, the voice of the provider. Uh, Forrester has been tracking the CX marketplace for a number of years, and we are covered by Forrester Research in really four key areas. We're a leader in customer feedback management. Um, you can see us up here in the, in the upper right. We're a leader in being uh, one of the strongest, in fact, actually the leading provider in the uh, text analytics platform space because a big part of really understanding the, the voice of the customer, the voice of the patient is being able to understand language. And we've made major investments in being really very, very good at teasing out themes and concepts from language. Um, because of the increasing importance of the contact center and calls and conversational analytics, we've made major investments in that. And we are also covered as a speech analytics provider. And finally, from a social engagement, social analytics perspective, uh, we offer the technology to collect and understand uh, interactions and feedback at scale from public and, and social sources as well. We work, I think importantly, across many different industries. Healthcare is a, is a major area of focus for us and has been one of the major growth drivers of, uh, of, of, of customer experience in general because of the dynamic nature of healthcare, particularly here in, in, in North America over the last few years. But any organization that has customers, that has conversations, that has a need to 
continuously listen and improve um, is an organization that can benefit from this type of experience analytics technology. And, and that includes retailers, financial services, technology companies, and, and travel and hospitality. And it's important to be able to quickly get value from these customer interactions and experiences. So what we've done is we've developed not just the core technology, but a set of templates and solutions that are designed to quickly make sense of the voice of your, of your customer, of your patient, in the language that they use when they're doing business with you in, in the context of healthcare or banking. And so what we've developed is those models, the language understanding, the analytics that are helpful to quickly turn what is a technology into fundamentally a business solution that helps you understand how to improve the patient experience and how to improve the healthcare experience um, from all aspects, whether it's you know, digital, in person, with patients and doctors and nurses, as well as over the contact center. So if there are questions about you know, how the technology works or how, uh, how it can be configured and deployed in a particular context, I'm happy to take a few questions, obviously, over the next few minutes. But uh, one of the things I would just leave with you as you think about um, using these kinds of solutions within your own organizations, we find it's very, very helpful to build out what we describe as a proof of concept. Um, where we would work with you to take some of the conversational data, your call data, your survey data, the information that comes from folks like CMS, and show you exactly what types of insights are kind of captured you know, in your business that you may not be teasing out um, with the kind of capability that you know, we can help you sort of accelerate. We also, uh, I think, can quickly identify areas of financial and performance improvement areas from a business quantified sort of return on investment perspective as well. And so we have a set of, you know, both technical people but also business analysts that can help you understand where are there some financial opportunities for process improvement, cost efficiencies, and even outcome improvements, if that's interesting. And then finally, once we've sort of identified the business and the technical, you know, rationale for a solution like this, we uh, would love to partner with any or all of you to help you drive continuous improvements in your organizations. With that, I will turn it back to you, Brian, and uh, we'll see if there are any questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Sid. It was an excellent presentation, and we will now begin today's question and answer session. So just as a reminder to everybody, please submit any questions you have by typing into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard, and we'll try to get through a few questions here before we sign off. Um, so Sid, okay. the first question we'll take is, how long does it take to establish a patient experience program? Are we, are we talking weeks or months here? Um, it's a good question. I, generally speaking, the solutions that we've deployed have generally been turned on in between two and four months. And it, 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 it's not months in the sense of six, 12, 18 months, but really you know, months, uh, weeks into the low digits of months. And the reason for that is there's really four key steps of, uh, of building and, and deploying the system. The first is identifying and connecting the, what we call listening posts into the solution. So that's going to be the calls, the, the surveys, the various types of feedback pl platforms that exist in the hospital setting or in, in a provider setting. The second is then applying and tuning the models that uh, are going to be teasing out insights from all that unstructured data. And that's a process of training uh, because language analytics requires a, a bit of sort of learning and training of those models, and we want to make sure that we have the most accurate and the most insightful insights from the language. The third piece is understanding um, the right analytics and making sure those analytics get deployed to the right stakeholders in an organization. And so we will typically want to identify what parts of the business are going to want to use the solution uh, and make sure that they have the view of the business that's going to answer the questions they have. And then the fourth is really just a, a kind of enablement and, and onboarding process where we provide a consulting service that helps make sure that everyone understands the technology, can use it, and it's kind of woven into their fabric of their day-to-day -day business operations. Um, the long pole in the tent is getting the data, which is that connecting the data, and that can take anywhere from a couple days to a few weeks depending on the environment that a hospital or, or a provider has. The remaining portions are fairly um, known and, and quantifiable regardless of you know, the, the complexity of the business because we've done these a number of times. But yeah, two to four or five months usually is what we see. Thank you so much for, for adding some uh, added clarity there. Really appreciate it. And so the next no question we'll take, the, atten the attendee asks, um, 
Does the solution support patient notes, telehealth, clinical information? Um, it can, and um, we have found that uh, when we are working, particularly in uh, patient you know, health settings, we will often bring in uh, the patient notes that come from hospital rounds data, you know, from nurses or doctors uh, annotating their, their observations of the patient. Um, telehealth is, an, is again, a new area for a lot of organizations, so we're starting to navigate what in the telehealth experience do people want to analyze. So we have developed some initial um, views of that from a, uh, you know, from a qualitative perspective, how is the interaction going, how is a provider providing an empathetic, a listening kind of quality, qualitative experience that's helpful to the patient, as well as quantitative sort of understanding the diagnoses and the, and the recommendations and other things. So I think you're going to find a lot more telehealth analytics going forward, but it, it is a new field for a lot of companies because, and a lot of organizations because it's just really kind of exploding on the scene right now. I expect you'll see a lot more telehealth options for analytics uh, going into 2021. Um, but right now, it's, it's nascent, and uh, there's a lot of interest in it. Yeah, that, that, all, that all tracks uh, from my perspective. Um, so the, mm -hmm. the next attendee question we'll take is, uh, they ask, how do you measure our ROI for these types of systems? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. I, we typically want to, when we are starting to work with an organization, we want to baseline um, the parts of the business that um, you know, executives in the organization identify as areas that they want to improve. And oftentimes we'll, in the contact center setting, it's going to come down to things like looking at what is the average length of a call, uh, how many times do people call to achieve an outcome, um, what is the average uh, satisfaction ranking from a survey after a call or after a patient experience. So we'll baseline those and work with the, um, the management of the organization to say, what do you think you should be at? You know, how do you want to get better? And once we know where they are and we know where they want to get better, we'll develop essentially an analytic framework that helps them identify the drivers of the underperformance and then help them figure out what steps they need to take to achieve improvement in scores. So in the contact center environment, we look at the long hauls. We look at what causes long hauls. We try to figure out what can be done from a people, a process, um, a systems perspective to make those calls shorter. In the case of satisfaction, you know, CAP scores or NPS scores will identify what tends to be the experiences described that correlate most to the low scores, and then identify a set of performance improvement areas that if we can fix bad experiences, generally you'll see those scores go up. And that process ultimately, if you save money in the contact center, translates to hard dollars. You do find NPS and, and satisfaction scores tend to translate into more reimbursements um, from CMS, which can generate you know, revenue, as well as more willingness of patients to continue to consider a provider their primary provider versus to essentially churn to a different provider. So that translates into loyalty. And so there is a hard sort of quantitative and financial benefit to focusing on improving both not just the medical outcomes, but the satisfaction outcomes and the cost outcomes. Those all translate into ROI. Thank you. Some some important points there. And this next question, it's a, it's a bit longer, but I think it's, it's interesting, so I'll, I'll work through it here. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of touches on how wayfinding fits into, you know, the patient care journey. So the the attendee asked, is data collected on the patient's experience and journey in regards to wayfinding, getting them from point A to point B without them getting lost? Reducing the negative outcome of their journey not only brings them back to the facility, um, but also impacts bottom dollar for the hospital. Yeah, no, that is a great question. Um, so the, the way, that just to kind of maybe summarize the question in, in sort of the language that I often use, every patient, when they, when they go into a hospital setting or any kind of healthcare setting, they have a journey, right? The journey will start with recognizing they need to go to a healthcare provider, you know, registering, getting an appointment, you know, waiting, having the first visit, if they have more treatments or they have to come back or they get checked in, right? That whole process defines the journey of the patient from beginning to end. And it can be measured in interactions. It can be measured in time. It can be measured in qualitative markers like, you know, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? That's a sentiment. Or is it getting difficult or getting hard? All of those things help you to identify whether that journey is optimized or whether it's sub-optimized. And the short answer to the question is, yes, we very much are interested in understanding 
and mapping those journeys into the analytics of you know, the ClaraBridge solution and into the analytics that then can provide very clear views that uh, when a customer or patient has a journey, what are the steps of the journey that set that journey back, meaning they, they turn a customer from being positive to negative, um, and that, that can create a moment of truth that means at this point this, this patient is no longer happy, they're not going to come back, um, or creates a moment of cost or liability or other kinds of impacts that can have a negative financial um, or outcome impact on the organization. And so we do very much want to stitch together all those interactions into a, into a map that then can be used to help understand not just what's the end-to-end -end journey, but what parts of the journey are most important, most critical to really focus on making better because they are critical parts of that, you know, that full experience. And uh, it, it starts with, again, applying models that we have that sort of define the traditional journeys in healthcare, but also working with organizations to make sure we understand the specific, um, you know, specific nuances and, and, and sort of uh, differences that might exist from one organization to the other. Thank you so much. Sid. Uh, thank you for tackling that one. It was a great question. We've had a bunch of great questions come in. Um, the next question I think we'll take here, just review them really quick. Um, so this next question here is, how do you overcome the barrier of the lag time between the implementation of a performance improvement and the patient's feedback, um, particularly with CAPS? Yeah, so there's, um, there's, a, there's sort of a, a concept that um, has developed in sort of survey research um, over the years, and it's described as sort of an inner loop versus an outer loop improvement. Um, an inner loop, um, and this grew out of a, the discipline of NPS, Net Promoter Score Surveys, over the last decade or so. An inner loop improvement is one where when a particular customer has a bad experience or an employee is doing something they shouldn't be doing, you immediately or as close to immediately as you can go back to that employee to tell them how they can do better or to that customer and try to resolve their individual issue. Uh, an outer loop fix is something where you see a trending issue that's not just affecting one person or one customer, but it affects you know a, not, a lot of people. And the root cause isn't necessarily to go back to each individual individual person that's had a negative experience, but you find out what's causing the negative experience and you fix the cause. And that fix could be a policy change, it could be a reconfiguration of a technology like your contact center switch or your IVR uh, or your website. Or it could be, you know, fundamentally changing behaviors through training so that people you know, solve a particular problem a different way or have a better understanding of the determinant that's causing this issue so that they can be more kind of precise in handling different types of people, different types of ways. And so what we find is that the inner loop stuff is important, particularly in managing and coaching employees to do better. But because of the kind of systematic nature of healthcare, what most patient um, or not so what most providers are typically not as good at is identifying the outer loop fixes and because the outer loop fixes you fix a problem and it affects not one but you know dozens to hundreds maybe even thousands of patients who have the similar type of experience that's where the real benefit is and we tend to focus on patient improvement on the outer loop a lot more um, and that uh, there is some lag I mean I'm not going to say that you find the problem and fix it the next day because oftentimes you're changing culture or you're changing processes but in the end, if you're doing that in a continuous way, you will always be driving continuous improvement. And that, I think, is the most important thing, is that you always want to be looking at not just fixing things tactically and quickly, but creating a systematic, sustained improvement in your business, in your culture, in the way your, your, your employees are handling uh, your, your customers. That's, that's where the real value is. Right, yeah, sort of uh, avoiding those Band-Aid solutions, right? Correct. I mean, and, and, you know, the question specifically around CAPS, right? So don't, we don't want to promise that, you know, you turn on, you turn on a system like ClaraBridge and your CAPS scores go up tomorrow, right? I mean, you will identify the problems, you want to implement the fixes, and then your CAPS scores should go up. And they go up not overnight, but they, they don't take forever either. Most organizations see material improvements in their CAPS scores in less than a year. Because in most organizations, there is very, very low-hanging fruit that just people haven't quantified. Um, often six to nine months. We had a, a major health insurer that's also a retail provider uh, we worked with that went from sort of an eighth ranking in their, uh, in their basically their NPS scores, which were kind of driving how they were rated against other providers, you know, in the country to first. 
and it was by focusing on, with a laser focus on improving those NPS scores and identifying the drivers of low performance and implementing changes over a period of about a year. So. Excellent. Yes, I, I think we'll do, we'll take one more audience question here before we move to some final thoughts. Um, so okay. the, the attend, this, this attendee asks if you could expand a bit on how, um, how this has been used or could be used for the staff employees within an, within an organization. Sure. So, well, I think there's there's two kind of two lenses on on employees. One is that you find um, oftentimes your frontline workers tend to be um, very very astute observers of ways to improve the patient experience, and so we do encourage um, using the employee solicited or even unsolicited feedback, whether it's coming in from patient notes or coming in from employee surveys. Um, or any kind of collaborative, you know, conversational platforms. A lot of times companies are using um, conversations now uh, through things like Slack and some of these newer collaboration technologies. You can create public forums where people can offer improvements, suggestions. That information becomes another way of tapping into the voice of your customer but through your employee to help improve the, the patient experience. Um, the second part of it is that there are things that drive employee happiness, employee satisfaction, and you want to put a lens on the employee feedback to try to understand what is it that's driving stresses, what are the issues that are creating confusion or frustration from your employees, and focus on improving those systems as well. Um, that has a beneficial effect of making your employees happier because they're being listened to and they're being sort of part of the process of improvement. And a happy employee almost always translates to a a better customer or patient experience as well. So there's a derivative benefit there as well. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, thank you for tackling all those questions, and thanks to our attendees for for asking such engaged and informed questions. Yeah, these are great questions. Sid, thank you. They really have. Been. Sid, do you have any any final thoughts to share with our attendees today? Um, no, I think I, the only thing I would say is that look, we uh, we at Clarebridge are very very passionate about using the voice of the customer, the voice of the patient to help organizations drive improvements in quality, improvements in outcome, improvements in financial performance. And um, it's entirely likely that I, I looked at the list of folks that were likely to sign up here. There are a lot of folks here that we've, we've solved problems very similar to the ones you probably are facing. We would encourage you to reach out to Clarabridge. Um, we are at www.clarabridge.com. Uh, if you have specific inquiries, uh, feel free to reach out to me personally. Um, I'm at sid.banerjee at clarabridge.com, and I'll make sure I can direct you to someone who can answer your question if I can. And again, thank you for your interest. And that concludes today's webinar. I want to thank Sid again for his excellent presentation and Clarabridge for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank you.